Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's exciting event where we will be looking at Echo Bible. Uh, I am going to be joined this evening by two of the planet's greatest ecology scholars and defenders. Uh, tonight, we'll be hearing from Rabbi Leo D. and Rabbi Jonathan Nerrell on their book, Echo Bible. I want to introduce myself. I'm Rabbi Daniel Friedman of Hampstead Garden Suburb Synagogue, and I want to say hello to the HGSS community, to the United Synagogue community, to thank Barry Coleman, who is in the background putting this all together from United Synagogue. Hello to Anglo Jury, to our friends in Israel and around the world. Uh, welcome to Rabbi D and Rabbi Nerol. Now, Rabbi D is a familiar face to us in Anglo Jury and in Hampstead Garden Suburb. Rabbi Leo D is the CEO of Chesed Research ESG. He received a master's in engineering from Cambridge University, a master's in public health from Hebrew University, and rabbinical ordination in Israel. However, it was a trip around the least affluent countries in Asia and South America that woke him up to the tremendous poverty that exists in the world. Encountering people who owned not much more than the clothes on their back, he began to understand the huge impact of a lack of food, water, and power suffered by half of humanity. I might add, when we talk about that lack of power, uh, with the snow in Israel right now, we might encounter some of those in this case, maybe first world issues. But uh, if we do have those, Rabbi D will be right back with us. Uh, but continuing with Rabbi D's uh, background. Uh, so following six years as a community rabbi in Hendon and Radlett, he moved to Israel where he has developed a passion for changing hearts and minds in order to encourage sustainable development, initially among the Israeli financial community and then within the field of responsible investment. He served as director of programs at the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. And we have with us Rabbi Yonatan Nerl, who founded and directs the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. Raised in California, Yonatan completed an MA and BA from Stanford University with a focus on global environmental issues and received rabbinical ordination in Israel. He has spoken internationally on religion and the environment, including at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi, the Fez Climate Conscience Summit at the Parliament of World Religions. He co-organized 10 interfaith environmental conferences in Jerusalem, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta. Welcome, Rabbi D. Welcome, Rabbi Nerol. Okay, so without further ado, we are going to begin this evening's program with some Torah from Rabbi Nerol. Thank you, Rabbi Friedman. It's great to be here with all of you. As Rabbi Friedman mentioned, right now it's snowing in Jerusalem and in the land of Israel. There's expecting 10 centimeters, which is the biggest snowstorm we've had in about seven years. The last, the, we had a snowstorm seven years ago that had 20 centimeters. Um, our kids are very excited for the ability to play tomorrow morning in the snow, which is a rare pleasure, which only comes once every few years here in Jerusalem. As Rabbi Friedman mentioned, uh, Rabbi D and I uh, co-authored and edited Eco Bible, an ecological commentary on the Hebrew Bible, on the Torah. Uh, volume one talks about Genesis and Exodus. And volume two, which we're going to be publishing in a few months, focuses on Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In total, we are looking at about 450 verses with ecological commentary gleaned from Jewish sages over the millennia. We mention rabbis of the Talmud, Maimonides, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, among others, in compiling Jewish wisdom that relates to the ecological challenge. I want to start with a story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was a Jewish sage living about 1800 years ago in Israel. And he gives a, a metaphor of somebody who drills a hole underneath their own seat. The metaphor is actually in re relation to a teaching that uh, all Jews 
uh, are responsible for one another, and that if one Jew sins, all all Jews feel the effect of that. The, the metaphor that Rabbi Shimon gives is of someone who drills a hole underneath their own seat, and uh, the other people on the ship go up to the person and say, "What are you doing? Why are you drilling underneath your own seat?" And the person says, "Well." I can do whatever I want. I've booked passage on the ship, and therefore, who are you to tell me what I can do underneath my own seat? This is here's my ticket. This is my seat. And the other people say, no, actually, what you're doing is going to affect all of us. And and this teaching is based on a couple of verses from the book of Job. And it's interesting because Rabbi Shimon doesn't give a reason for why the person is drilling underneath their own seat. A lot of people, when they hear this teaching, think that the person is crazy. This this person must be psychotic. <laughs> what rational reason is there for a person to drill underneath their own seat? And yet, Rabbi Shimon doesn't give a reason. And if you think to yourself for a minute, I'd like to encourage you to try to think of a rational reason for why this person would drill underneath their own seat. What need do they have? And how does drilling underneath their own seat fulfill that need? So a few possibilities are that the person's hungry and they want to fish. They don't have an ability to fish by putting a line underneath their seat otherwise. And so they fish underneath their own seat. They drill a small hole and this is how they get food. Or perhaps they want to harvest some seaweed underneath their seat in order to go with the fish that they catch because they did bring rice onto the ship and they want to eat sushi. Another possibility is they simply have to go to the bathroom, and this is the easiest way to do that. Or another possibility is they want to cool down their feet, and this is the way that they can do that without you know, jumping into the water. So those are a few rational reasons for, for why someone would drill underneath their own seat. The second question that I'd like to pose to you is, what can the other people on the ship do to cause this person to stop drilling underneath their seat, aside from tying the person up or throwing them overboard. So one possibility is they could tell the person, well, let me fulfill your need in a different way. What is your need? If you're hungry, let me give you food. Here's a sandwich. If you're thirsty and we're wanting to drink fresh water from the sea, then here's or from, you know, a fresh water body of water, then here's some, a bottle of water for you. Or if the person needs to go to the bathroom, then they could show the person to a bathroom. There's different ways to meet, meet that person's need without having to drill underneath their own seat. Now, a third question that I'll pose to you is, why does this person disregard other people's welfare? How, how could it be that this person doesn't care about the other people on the ship? And one reason is because the person thinks that... Th whatever impact their drilling will cause is long-term. It's not going to affect them, and they have this immediate need. And therefore, they have to fulfill that need um, because they're so hungry or they're so thirsty or they have to go to the bathroom. These are very urgent needs. Uh, another thing that could be going on in this person's head is that they think that a small hole won't cause, long, won't cause a big damage. This is just a small hole that they're drilling, and... This, this won't cause long-term damage, so they drill. So I want to relate this teaching to the ship Titanic, which, as you know, was built in Belfast and uh, set sail from Southampton, England, in 1912 in April. And Captain Edward Smith, uh, he, he, uh, this was about 300 years after uh, Captain John Smith started the Jamestown colony in Virginia, Captain Edward Smith set sail for the North Atlantic, for New York, and was sailing full steam ahead when he hit an iceberg. And the question is, why would Captain Smith, who was one of the best captains and was therefore given this biggest ship in the world, why, why was he doing that? And to one possibility is that he didn't realize that there would be icebergs in the North Atlantic. But then the question is, well, the Titanic received messages from 11 ships that there was actually a large ice pack. Now, the reason Captain Smith didn't think that there would be an ice pack in the North Atlantic is because usually there's not. 
at that time of year in the North Atlantic. This just happened to be an exceptionally cold winter. And there was an ice pack 100 miles long and 100 miles wide that he didn't anticipate. Another idea is that Captain Smith thought that he'd be able to turn around the ship, or at least to turn the ship, in time to avoid an iceberg if they saw it. However, they never did safety checks when they left the Belfast Harbor because they thought that the ship was unsinkable. It was a metaphor for industrial society. And therefore, when the person on the watchtower saw the iceberg ahead at 11.30 p.m. at night on April 12, 1912, they only had 35 seconds to turn the ship. And at that point, they didn't have enough time to turn the ship. So a third ship that I want to briefly mention is the is planet Earth as a ship. Here in Israel, there's been flooding this winter more than any other winter. The city of Naharia has flooded uh, almost every two weeks. The mayor of Naharia said it's essentially un untenable that the current situation, Naharia is on the northern coast, uh, north of Haifa. And in the United States, they just had a once in a century storm that is so cold that even southern Texas is freezing. freezing. Places like San Antonio, Texas, on, on, the, on the Caribbean coast, on the Gulf of Mexico coast, they've rescued thousands of sea turtles and put them in a stadium uh, because the sea turtles were freezing, but the stadium lost power. And so things are, things are starting to fall apart. Now, it's amazing because in Britain, uh, there seems to be much greater ecological awareness than in, 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 in North America. Uh, the, the former colonies would do well to learn from their mothership. Uh, and the question is, how do we live sustainably on this collective ship that is planet Earth? That's, that's, a, that's one of the questions that we deal with in Eco Bible. Um, and I believe that religion has deep things to say about ecological sustainability, that the ecological crisis is not a crisis of primarily of nature and of, of the environment. It's a crisis of the human being and, and how we live as spiritual beings in a physical reality. And therefore, your engaging on this as part of your synagogue is, is significant. And there's a movement in England, the eco-synagogues movement, which is gaining traction, uh, which is makes England one of the, the most uh, ecologically progressive places in terms of synagogue commitments for sustainability. Uh, and so that's that's a short introduction to Jewish ecology from my perspective. And so now I'd like to to hand it over to Rabbi D to, to continue the conversation. Good evening and uh, thank you to uh, Rabbi Friedman uh, for your kind invitation this evening. And thank you, Jonathan. Um, a number of people asked um, us why we wrote an Eco Torah, which we call the Eco Bible. And why we didn't write uh, one about feminism, about virus, about epidemics, general economics and Torah, but why an ecological Torah commentary? And I think the best answer comes from Rav Cook, because Rav Cook says that the Torah can be understood on four levels. It can be understood from the perspective of the individual. What does the Torah say to me as an individual? How does it change? How does it uh, advise me to, to run my life? It then has a higher level, says Rav Kook, which is, how does it speak to me as a member of the Jewish people? Um, and then, says Rav Kook, it actually has a third level, which is even higher than that. How does it speak to me as a member of humanity? And finally, says Rav Kook, he says, there's a person who rises even higher until he unites with all existence, with all creatures, and with all worlds. This is the person who, engaged in the chapter of song every day, is assured that he's a child of the world to come. Says Rav Kook, the highest level to understand the Torah is the ecological level of the Torah. Strangely enough, to feel as an individual that we are part of not just the Jewish people, not just humanity, but actually all of nature together. And um, why is it that uh, an ecological commentary to the Torah has not been written in this form until now, 2,000 years, um, well, after 2,000 years of exile, three and a half thousand years after the Torah was written. And I'd like to suggest one answer, which is that actually, um, for 2,000 years in exile, our rabbis were not too keen to position us as members of humanity per se. So we focus a lot on Jews as individuals and Jews as part of the Jewish people. Um, and therefore, a lot of the commentaries that we will read 
in our Chumashim will focus on those two. And this third stage of Jews as part of humanity and, and looking at non-Jews and Jews together as, as some sort of cohesive group somehow fell by the wayside during exile. And therefore the fourth level, which is there amongst our uh, commentators, um, was somehow misunderstood or didn't seem to have the importance or, or, or the connection to the other two that it should have had. Um, just as an interesting aside, in uh, Parsha Yitro, uh, we see that Yitro was the first person to bless Hashem. Uh, although Maltisedek, uh, previously in Genesis, also blesses God, but not in the same way. And um, Rav Soloveitchik says that actually it's interesting that these two non-Jews are the first people to bless God in our Torah, but actually that tells us something very str uh, strong about the purpose of Jewish life, which is to inspire not just the Jewish people, but also um, mankind in general. But what we see is there are four levels, according to Rav Cook, and the highest level is to see ourselves as part of creation. So I want to give you a little flavor of what that means in terms of the Eco Bible that we've published. Um, and one of the key issues uh, for uh, mankind at the moment is sustainability. And it's known that um, today we are consuming the resources of about one and a half planets, actually 1.7 planets. Um, that means that we're overusing our water, we're uh, cutting down too many rainforests to make uh, beef, uh, we're using uh, irreplaceable uh, minerals. And, uh, and commodities, and we're using more than we can actually replenish. Um, not only that, because of the growth of, uh, of uh, mankind over the next, of, of the human population over the next 30 years, uh, we're set to double that consumption to about three planets worth. Um, and so, so sustainability is a, is a critical issue. How can we sustain less? How can we control our uh, utilization of the planet's resources? So. I want to give three examples of many which appear in the Eco Bible as to how the Torah answers this question for us. So one question is sustainable water. Well, the Torah teaches us in Numbers 2019, um, Moses is speaking at this point to the Edomites who refuse to let the Jewish people pass through their land. He says, if we or our cattle drink your water, we'll pay for it. Now you might say that verse is not that interesting, and most of us would not actually spend much time reading it over and over again. But I'll tell you something, there's something in that verse which is absolutely world-changing, and the only people to, funnily enough, to have read that verse were the Jews. And yet it was there for everyone in mankind to read for three and a half thousand years. If we are a candidate, kind of we will pay for it. Now, why is this interesting? Because if you look at water policy, in countries all over the world, people do not pay for their water. In England, in America, in Europe, in Africa and Asia, water is either free or very cheap, but certainly does not represent, in terms of its cost per unit, the price of the water that actually uh, the actual water actually costs. And funnily enough, where is a charge at the price at which it costs is Israel. Israel charges around $290 for 1,000 meters cubed of water versus on average $20 per 1,000 meters cubed in other Middle Eastern countries, more than 10 times uh, the cost uh, of water. A uh, challenge for all of us in Israel who have to pay for water, but what it means is that Israel is the first country to invent and to adopt uh, water-saving devices such as um, the half flush on the toilet. And of course, Israel invented drip irrigation. Why? Because if you're paying the full price for water, then obviously you want to preserve it and conserve it in the way that you should. And Israel, of course, has the highest level of recycling of water in the world, about 80% or more, compared to Spain, which I think is about 20%, America, which is 5%. Other countries don't come close. So there's sustainable water in the Torah. The first is in uh, the world to actually charging a price or paying a price for water, the price that it actually uh, should be. Uh, what about uh, another topic, food, sustainable fishing? 
So it's interesting, the verse in the Torah in uh, Genesis reads, God blessed them, the fish, saying, be fertile and multiply, fill the waters and the seas. So anyone discerning might ask the following question. What does it mean, be fertile and multiply? Surely if the fish are having uh, lots of children, lots of uh, baby fish, lots of eggs, surely they're gonna multiply. Isn't it obvious? Why just tell me, multiply? Or just tell me, be fertile, but don't tell me, be fertile and multiply. So I'll tell you something, it's fascinating that scientists today say there are two challenges for fish populations in the seas. One, of course, is overfishing, which means that we're taking out more fish than are, are being born. And this is uh, actually a sad, um, sadly seen on our plates, because if uh, you're as old as I am, you'll remember that when you had cod and chips, you used to have a slice of cod, uh, which was this big, like probably like, you know, a tenth of a, of a codfish, um, which had been sliced off with your, with your chips. And today, if you have cod and chips, you probably have the whole fish, which means we're, we're fishing them out younger and younger, and they're not replenishing. So overfishing is um, the challenge to multiply. But what about be fertile? So the other challenge for uh, fish is actually pollution. There's more plastic now in the ocean than there are fish. And it turns out that pollution and other environmental impacts have health impacts on fish. And this reduces their reproductive capability. So actually, when the Torah tells us be fertile and multiply, maybe it's referring to these two issues. Help the, the, the fish to be reproductive by not ruining their environment and also don't overfish them. These are two commands which can command us to be sustainable fishermen. And what about another topic of sustainability that's very important today, sustainable forestry? Well, we can go to our Pasha this week, actually, Pasha Truma, and we can see that um, the Jews built um, a large chunk of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, using acacia wood. And the rabbis asked the question, where did they get acacia wood in the desert? And Rashi answers, based on the Midrash, that Yaakov, Jacob, anticipated with divine inspiration that the Israelites would build a Mishkan in the desert. And so he brought acacia seeds with him to Egypt and he planted them for future generations to take the wood out with them. So we see here a, a literally a sustainable forest. The first example of sustainable forestry probably in the history of mankind according to the Midrash, was Jacob taking the seeds, planting them in order that the wood could be used, not cutting down random trees that he just happened to find in the desert. And of course, there are acacia trees in the desert, um, but actually planting them in order to make sure that the number of trees in the desert would remain there doing the job that they have to do to keep the soil in, intact, whilst actually planting new trees uh, in order to um, use their particular wood. And since we're on Parshat uh, Truma, um, I thought they would give a couple more ideas which uh, are relevant from the Eco Torah to this week's Parsha. So another beautiful idea, which you find in the Eco Bible, is in this week's Parsha, it teaches us that the Arana Kodesh, the Holy Ark, was actually made of three layers. It was made of wood, acacia wood, as we said, but it was layered on the top, um, on top and underneath with gold. So actually, you saw gold, but inside was this hidden layer of wood, which provided the structure. So why was that? Well, we can look to uh, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch to give us an answer. And he explained the significance of the gold covering of the ark as follows. He said, the holy mark ark is made out of three boxes, the middle of wood, the outer, and the inner of gold. The ark symbolizing the Torah scholar, the receptacle of Torah, must be incorruptible and pure, both inside and outside, but he must view himself only as wood, not gold. He must view himself only as wood, not gold. Now remember the gold is a metal, the metal that's probably least reactive, and therefore it is impervious to weather conditions. Well, how often do we think of ourselves as impervious human beings? protected by a golden protective service, surface and able to use and abuse the environment, disposing of single-use plastics and pumping carbon into the atmosphere. And then suddenly the 
structure of the Aron Kodesh, according to Rabbi Samson, Paul Hirsch teaches us that inside that impervious gold structure lies a very sensitive wooden box. And that's us. And that as much as we believe that we are impervious to the environment and the things and the damage that we do to the environment around us, so we should remember that actually we are made out of uh, very reactive and very sensitive uh, components, such as the wood. Um, another uh, insight uh, regarding the Mishkan, because the Mishkan, uh, you might think, what, what's the Mishkan got to do with ecology? It's, it was the, uh, the pre precursor to the temple in Jerusalem. It was schlepped around the desert for 40 years and for many years afterwards around, the, around Israel before um, the temple was built. What, what has it got to do with ecology? Why, why, uh, why should it be? Well, funnily enough, um, the Mishkan was com uh, comprised of 15 different materials. We're told about that at the beginning of this week's parasha. And if you look at it uh, carefully, you'll find there were actually um, a group of minerals, a group of animal materials, and a group of plant materials. The, the, the mineral materials were gold, silver, and copper, and so forth. Uh, the animal materials were the blue and purple wools, goat hair, ram and tachish skin, uh, tachash skins. And the plant, uh, the plant categories were fine linen, acacia wood, uh, crimson silk, spices for the oil and spices for the incense. We see that there was a beautiful and perfectly balanced mix of natural components in the Mishkan. And the Mishkan is coming to teach us about God's divine resting place on earth, being in a place where there's a perfect balance of nature between animals and plants and minerals. And that must be a lesson for us in our lives because we meant to live in the image of God. And therefore, if it's important to God to have a, a perfect balanced ecosystem in his Mishkan, then clearly there's a message there for us to have a perfectly balanced balanced ecosystem in the world around us, which is something today we're perfectly capable of achieving if we set us, our minds upon it. And one last thought, um, which is not actually Pasha Truma, it's actually Pasha uh, Tetzaveh, which is the week afterwards, um, but a similar idea, the Choshen HaMishpat, right? The holy breastplate of the law. Um, and the Chida states, it was made of five materials, why was it made of five materials? He said to represent the two witnesses and three judges in a Jewish court of law. The rabbi stated that the breastplate of law came to atone for misjudgments by Jewish courts. Says the Chida that the five materials that make up the uh, breastplate of the law come to represent divine judgment and atonement. Well, what are these five components? Well, one is gold. One is the blue uh, wool, one is the purple wool, then you've got the crimson silk, and finally the fine twisted linen. Well, let me tell you, the gold is, of course, the mineral component. The linen is the plant component. The blue and purple wools and the crimson silk actually are derived from animals, but interestingly, from three different types of animals. You see, the techelet and the argaman in the wools is derived from the sea snail. The wool itself is derived from the sheep, which is the land animal. And the silk is derived from the silk moth, which is obviously an airborne animal. And so we see that the testimony, divine judgment, comes from five parts of nature, mineral, animal, plant, and all types of animals. And we will be judged according to uh, the Chidam, we're building on the Chidam, that we are being judged on how we walk alongside nature, plants and animals and even minerals and not over mining and, uh, and taking too much out of the earth that we cannot replenish. So we see here we've got a number of different uh, uh, examples of how ecology comes into the Torah, which we tried to um, lay out for you a little bit um, and of course the eco uh, bible gives um, 
a number of commentaries for every Pasha of the, of the year. Um, thank you very much for inviting us this evening and thank you for um, listening and uh, I'd like to hand back to Rabbi Friedman. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rabbi Narell and Rabbi D, for that incredible uh, introduction to your really comprehensive work. Just before I do speak about the work, I want to encourage our viewers to please post questions in the Facebook Live uh, comment section. We can see those questions. Uh, Rabbi Narell and Rabbi D, to those questions. Uh, please do ask the question. Um, I ask a couple of questions that, um, you know, I, I really think that the, the, the work you've done on, on this Eco Bible is uh, so comprehensive, uh, amazing, an incredible uh, work that you've really, am I allowed to say, mined um, all of the sources for, um, you know, throughout history. And, and I think it's a very brave work as well, I might add. Uh, in terms of some of the scholars that you've included uh, in today's generation. Um, and um, I, I think that no doubt the uh, purpose of that was to appeal to as broad an audience as possible. We need as many people in this fight as, as we can because you know, the, we are depleting the Earth's resources and you know, the more people engage, the, the more uh, greater the chance that we will be able to um, fight back. Um, I, I'm going to put out a couple of uh, questions here uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, I hope you will see it as, as not something that's come from you personally, but, you know, questions that you no doubt are leveled with, um, you know, probably on a near daily basis that, um, you know, that, that some of our viewers are probably thinking about. Um, okay, so the first thing First question I want to ask you is, I mean, Rabbi D, you said that the at the moment we're depleting resources at a rate of a planet and a half. We could go to three planets. Uh, what would you say, and don't answer this yet because I'll give it to either of you and I'll ask the second question as well. What would you say to those who say, well, the Almighty has placed us here. He has unlimited resources. There's so much that we probably haven't yet found. One thinks of the, the gas off the coast of Haifa, to talk about natural gas. Um, and uh, I mean, th things happen. We get technology gets better and we get good at using things. So, um, you know, the, if the Almighty has given it to us, why, why um, slow down? So that's question number one. Question number two uh, is you've provided incredible sources as to um, why we should uh, protect the planet, work for uh, on behalf of the environment. But at the same time, uh, there, there must be certain practices in Judaism, in the Torah, that uh, seem to conflict. I mean, we, we raise animals that um, we have methane issues. I mean, I'm sure there's a, a, there are a lot of things that, that, that could be complicated. It's probably a very um, silly, basic um, um, idea. But, but there must be some ideas that, that have been in conflict that you had to work through and resolve, and maybe you could share if there are issues in the Torah that, that needed some finessing, um, for want of a better word, if that's a fair word, to be able to uh, develop this um, ecological Bible um, idea. Uh, so let's start with those two questions. Um, I, I know also, Rabbi Nerol, um, you might want to, if, you, if you'd like to come back to the um, idea of, of the individual on the boat, um, also feel free. So I, I give it to, to either of you to take it away. Well, well maybe I'll take a first swing. Um, they're, they're great questions you're raising, Rabbi Friedman. And, um, you know, you, you've essentially summed up the worldview of a lot of people, not just Jews, but of people of other faiths as well, which is this idea that, you know, God created planet Earth and therefore it's a big planet. God's going to take care of us. We don't need to worry. We can do whatever we want to the planet. And there's unlimited resources uh, and that whatever humans do doesn't really have an effect. Well, there, there's a midrash that God, a Jewish teaching from about 1500 years ago that, that God showed Adam the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to him, see how 
beautiful and praiseworthy are my works. Everything I created, I created for you. Be careful not to destroy or despoil my world. For if you do, there will be no one after you to repair it. You know, last week, Israel did the first uh, drone flight around the world. Th this world actually isn't so big. And, you know, we've... Uh, People, you know, a lot of people have flown around the world. It, it's it's not it, Magellan explored the world about 500 years ago for the first time. He sailed around the world, but you know, it's amazing. As as Leo mentioned, it's 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 likely that in 19 years there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish, and the ocean is huge. The ocean is 70 percent of the Earth's surface, and so this idea that you know we can't impact nature, that there's some sort of theological principle that, that we can't have an effect on our common home. Well, you know, just go look at some industry in London, you know, and look at the pollution coming from that industry. It's, it's an industrial society is very strong. And, 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 act, and actually part of this relates to environmental justice, that, that minority communities tend to be more impacted by by this. Um, and so therefore, you know, I, I don't see it as a theological principle that we can just do whatever we want here and that it, it either will have no effect or even if it does have an effect that God or the Messiah will somehow just wave a magic wand and it will all go away. I, I don't see such a statement in, in any Jewish teaching um, that we can be irresponsible and, and God will, you know, uh, just forgive us for acting totally contrary to God's will with no repercussions. <laughs> that, 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 that's not a Jewish principle. Um, and actually, I, I have a book here, which is, um, it's a thick book coming out of the, the Haredi, uh, like a Haredi yeshiva in Jerusalem, like a traditional ultra-Orthodox yeshiva about, about Jewish law through the context of Baal Tashchit, which, which relates to your second question, in terms of Jewish practices today, Baal Tashchid is the principle of do not waste or destroy. And, and I was just learning it about, you know, for example, we're coming up to Purim. Uh, next week is Purim. And there's a practice that a lot of Jews have uh, to celebrate Purim by buying new costumes for their kids, that every year their kids get a new costume you, that you buy on Amazon or Alibaba or uh, you know some other clothing store, um, and there's a custom of uh, you know of giving mishloch manot of giving gifts to one's friends in in disposables and in wrapped in plastic, and and the ecological footprint of our Purim celebration is tremendous, <laughs> and 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 it's and I and I said to my kids this year because my my son was taking out his Purim costumes from the past few years, I said to him. Why don't you wear this amazing ninja suit that you have that you've only worn a few times? Or he has this great lion costume. I said, well, why don't you wear this Purim? Because in any event, we're not even going to see other people this Purim. <laughs> so, 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 and, and so that's what I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's not one of the Ten Commandments to buy a new Purim costume every year for every kid. And the ecological footprint of doing so is huge. And that also has to be taken into account as part of the equation of how do we live a, a spiritual life. And, and that goes back to the teaching of Rabbi Shimon about drilling on the ship. We are that person. We're not crazy, but each of us is drilling a small hole on the collective ship. And, and yes, when you drill a lot of holes sooner or later, it will impact the ship. And, and we're, we know that now there's 8 billion people and the Jews are supposed to be the rudder on the ship. We're supposed to guide the direction of the ship. And that's, that's our role. We're supposed to be a light into the nations and therefore digging deep in the Torah, you know, mining the Torah for its ecological wisdom is, is what we've tried to do. And we feel like that that's what, you know, and, and we're trying to get this out to the hearts and minds of, of the Jewish community and beyond. Right. Um, okay, I'd, lo I'd love to answer the question myself. Um, thank you, Anton. Thank you, Rabbi uh, Friedman, for the beautiful questions. Let me, let me take the second question, which um, which um, Yonta didn't address so much, which is, um, are there non-sustainable practices in the Torah um, and how do we deal with that? So I think that's that's an excellent question and um, one mustn't turn oneself uh, away from it. 
But it's interesting. I mean, I, I think obviously the, the obvious uh, question is korbanot, sacrifices, right? So we have sacrifices which re require us to uh, have uh, a lot of uh, cows and sheep um, and, and birds being uh, cultivated. Um, and of course, that has a technological uh, footprint. Um, you know, for, for those of us, um, Jonathan is a, is a vegan. For those who are, are vegans, you know, the, the question of meat is, is a big issue, particularly in, the, in, in the Jewish practice. So how, how do we deal with that? So I'd like to perhaps address it in two different ways, um, maybe three. Um, but first of all, um, we've got uh, Ralph Cook, who famously says that in the, in the next temple, we're only going to have uh, minutes of offering and everything's going to be going to be a vegan uh, temple. Um, so that, uh, of course, deals with, <laughs> with that quite nicely uh, alongside his book on vegetarianism, where he basically says that the whole idea of eating meat and the co con concession to eat meat um, is basically um, appealing to human nature at its worst, perhaps. And the idea is that we'll wean ourselves off meat and the whole laws of kashrut are there to actually wean us off meat. So all the blood and all the gore is there to make it as really unpleasant as possible. And you know, the fact that we cover the blood when we kill the animal is to say we're embarrassed that we've spilled blood. So we're going to cover the blood, says Rav Cook. Um, the fact that the Torah says itself that actually I'll let you eat meat, meat um, in order to calm your taiva, your um, your desires, but actually it's not lechatil. It's not a. It's not something a priori that you should be doing, um, and so forth. So, so, so that's one answer, which is that actually, um, according to some commentators, um, that uh, meat eating and, and and even in the temple is not uh, a priori, and actually may may uh, stand to change in the future. The second thing, um, really, studying uh, Pesachim uh, in Dafyomi at the moment, um, one is forced to ask the question, how many sheep uh, or, or kids were actually sacrificed um, in um, the temple, even at the peak? Um, and obviously Pesach was the time which was a bit of a bloodbath. Um, but it's not clear really from the text, in my opinion, that, that there were really hundreds of thousands of sheep. And I'm not sure if you worked it out whether it would be feasibly, feasibly possible to actually kill hundreds of thousands of, of sheep and whether there even were enough sheep and kids uh, you know, uh, uh, lambs in the country, or could be, to feed uh, everybody as, as as one might imagine. So really, apart from Pesach, which itself is a little bit problematic, um, there really were very few animals killed um, for temple practice. I mean, if you had the two um, a lot, the two uh, daily offerings uh, each day, but that was for the whole Jewish people. And then you had you know, a festival offering, didn't you? You had 70 bulls on um, Sukkot. You know, that was for the whole Jewish people. They were talking about, you know, five million people at the time of the Second Temple. Um, so there wasn't a huge amount. And certainly the way that uh, animals were, were bred was very different to now. Every animal had, you know, was, was treated on an individual basis. The shrita was done and is designed on a one-to-one on -one basis. It doesn't really work, in, in my opinion, in, in, in its sort of mass slaughter, uh, as, as we know. So, um, so perhaps, you know, things have changed. Perhaps things will change, um, and perhaps um, the Torah's message to us is that we should be the agent to make them change. Well, thank you both so much for a truly extraordinary evening and an inspirational work. Uh, once again, to our viewers should know Eco Bible. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I also believe that through the Shul. Uh, we have a number of copies available, uh, so please speak to Gail in the office. But I want to thank you both. Uh, I know that it's it's you know, the amount of work that you've put into this, and I know it's a lifelong passion for both of you, but really it should be a lifelong passion for all of us. So hopefully uh, your motivation, your uh, enthusiasm has rubbed off on us, uh, this evening, and we'll continue to rub off on. I know that you're also, uh, like you mentioned, and all the and light into the nations that your eco Bible, uh, Rabbi Neril, you've told me, has uh, appealed to a number of um, Christian congregations and audiences as well. So that's that's really fabulous news. So I want to wish you both Hatzlacharaba in all of your vital work, and together may we make this 
planet a, a better, more sustainable place to live for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you so much.